Uh, first of all, let me, um, let me recommend, uh, I know this is uh, Ligonier, but let me recommend uh, Great Commission Publications. They've just published uh, a children's version of Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, this is an abridged version. This isn't the complete Pilgrim's Progress. This is meant as an introduction for children, and it also comes with a, a wonderful uh, CD uh, that's, uh, how can I say this? It's, uh, you know, acted out uh, with voices and stuff, and uh, do recommend that. And, and um, I'm saying that because this is the generation that possibly could uh, lose touch with Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress, part one, was published in 1678, and part two was published in 1684, and it's been in print uh, ever since, has been perhaps next to the English Bible, um, the most published book in the English language. Uh, I uh, wasn't raised in a Christian home or anything like it, and, uh, but I did uh, get uh, a typical British 1960s classical uh, education, state education, uh, seven, eight years of Latin and all of that stuff. And, but I do remember in, in high school uh, reading as part of an English literature course, uh, 17th century English literature course, uh, Pilgrim's Progress and Milton's uh, Paradise uh, Lost and, and uh, Paradise Regained and uh, Shakespeare and so on. Um, so I, I read Pilgrim's Progress, didn't mean a whole lot to me, I have to say, as a teenager. And then uh, when I was uh, converted, uh, I was 18, first year at uh, university, was a math major, I was given by my wife's uh, roommate and, and her best uh, friend, uh, I was given uh, for a birthday present one year, a leather bound, I still have it, uh, um, a, a kind of deluxe um, edition of Pilgrim's Progress and read it. And I, th I think I can say with some degree of sincerity that I've read it every year since then. Uh, I've also read Lord of the Rings every year since then, but, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, but actually, there is a connection because um, Bunyan tells the story, Pilgrim's Progress, in uh, a genre, in a, in a parabolic form, in a, in a fantasy-like form. It was a new form in the 17th century. It was new to him. It was new to his uh, readers. Uh, and of all generations uh, that understands the value of that kind of literature, ours is it. So, the fact that, we're, that, we, that we love Lord of the Rings or the Narnia Chronicles or, um, or what is it? Shout it out. Sorcerers, witches. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Thank you. I've never read Harry Potter. Never read it, uh, glimpsed maybe a couple of movies for half an hour or so, but, but I know nothing about it. But, but my point is that for, uh, for our generation, that kind of literature, uh, allegorical, fantasy, parabolic literature, whatever you want to accurately call that literature, uh, appeals to this generation. And I think that we have an opportunity to ensure that future generations um, get as much out of Pilgrim's Progress uh, that past generations have done. Um, who was John Bunyan? John Bunyan was born in 1628 and died in 1688. Uh, he's 17th century. He lives for 60 years. He lives uh, through a period in the 1640s when England uh, is in a period of civil war. Uh, the Roundheads and Cavaliers, the Parliamentarians and uh, the Royalists, and uh, Bunyan comes from 
a home where his mother had died, his father remarried uh, very quickly, within, within weeks, a couple of months after his mother died, his, his father remarried. They did that sort of thing in the 17th century. Um, but John Bunyan was very impressionable. He was uh, 14 or 15 or so when his mother died. And uh, he did, uh, evidently did not have a great relationship either with his father or with his uh, new uh, mother-in-law. And he uh, leaves home, uh, joins uh, the army, the parliamentary army, uh, lies, I think, about his age, uh, and is involved in the civil war. Now, I don't think John Bunyan ever saw conflict uh, personally. I think he saw the results of conflict and, and probably saw many wounded, terribly wounded soldiers coming back to barracks uh, and so on. And that war uh, drifted on for a couple of years uh, until uh, eventually Bunyan uh, and, and all the rest are released uh, from uh, that military service, and Bunyan becomes a, a, a brassier, a, a, a kind of guy who would be peripatetic, who'd go from home to home fixing you know, pots and, and, and pans. Now, these days, if you're, if you're frying pan, you know, the, your non-stick frying pan is sticking, you throw it in the trash and you go to Walmart or somewhere and you buy a new one. Well, in the 17th century, you'd call John Bunyan and he would come and he would fix it, uh, whatever was uh, wrong with it. And um, John Bunyan uh, marries and has four uh, children, his wife, uh, then uh, dies. Uh, we, we do not know her name. Uh, one of the great uh, anomalies uh, of Bunyan's life, we don't, we don't actually have a record of his first wife's name, and then uh, he remarries, but he finds himself now in the 16, uh, in the 16, have, having gone through a decade where England is a republic, the only decade in, in English history when England is a republic, uh, in 1660, everything gets changed. Everything is reversed. Charles I's head was cut off in 1649. It was the end of the monarchy in 1660. You have the restoration of Charles uh, II, and, and those who had been persecuted in the 1650s now become the persecutors in the 1660s. Uh, John Bunyan, uh, John Bunyan has, been, has been converted. He has started preaching. Uh, but in 1660, uh, through a series of parliamentary uh, acts, uh, unless you had a license to preach from uh, the established church, uh, the Church of England, uh, that preaching was viewed as illegal. And John Bunyan gets himself on the wrong side of uh, various parliamentary acts uh, that eventually in 1660, uh, somewhere late 1660s, uh, late 1660 and early 1661, uh, he is uh, arrested and he is uh, sent to trial uh, and uh, he is convicted and he goes to prison. Uh, he was meant to be in prison uh, maybe three to six months or so, uh, but because of the circumstances of the 1660s, he ends up in prison for 12 years until 1672. Now, he is uh, released. He becomes the pastor of uh, Bedford Baptist Church. You can still go there today. Uh, and uh, he was re-arrested again in 1676. 1677 and spends another six to eight months in prison. So he has two periods in prison, one 12 years and one six to eight months. And it's during those two imprisonments uh, that he writes Pilgrim's Progress Part 1. Now, let me, let me say uh, there, are two, uh, there are two parts. Uh, how many have read how many have… Oh, no, I can't ask you how many have not read, but how many have read part two of Pilgrim's Progress? This is the story of Christiana uh, and the four boys. Yeah, this is amazing. You know, actually, 
part two of Pilgrim's Progress is, is as interesting and in some places more interesting than part one. It's a very different story. Uh, part one is the story of Christian. It's a very heroic story. It's the story of a, a man who gets a sudden conversion, uh, and, and it's a very dramatic conversion, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, guilt and a lot of heaviness due to sin, and eventually, uh, eventually he, he engages in a lot of battles and so on. It's a very heroic story. Part two, part two is the woman's story the family story. It's about, it's about Mrs. Christian, Christiana. It's about, it's about the four boys. Uh, Bunyan, in part two, has been a pastor much longer than he had been in part one, and, and I think you, you sense that in reading part two. He, he, he makes some very important uh, pastoral insights in part two that just because your Christian experience isn't heroic and dramatic, it is still valid Christian experience. Uh, let's get back to part one. Uh, I, I have with me here the Penguin Classics uh, edition. Uh, I, I like this edition because it has uh, footnotes and side notes, and these are notes that Bunyan himself added uh, after he published um, Pilgrim's Progress. When he wrote it, uh, he tells us in, a, in, a, in the preface, uh, he did it for himself initially. He was, he was in prison. Uh, it, 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 it was a kind of imprisonment that allowed him to have writing materials. Uh, his second wife would visit him on a daily basis, bring him food and so on. It was still imprisonment. Uh, it wasn't the harshest imprisonment that you could ever imagine or anything like it, but it was confinement and imprisonment, but he did have a, a writing desk. You can go to Bedford uh, today and do the John Bunyan uh, Museum tour. It's a, it's a very fine tour, and they have a mock-up of the prison and uh, the, the desk and chair where he would have uh, sat and, and, written, and written many things. In the course of John Bunyan's 60 years, he wrote uh, over 60 volumes, some of them uh, very deep theological volumes. John Bunyan uh, never went to school uh, much after the age of probably 11 or 12. After that, uh, he was working uh, at home, uh, earning money uh, with his uh, father. He was, uh, he was being trained in the discipline of, uh, of a brassier, of mending uh, pots and pans and so on. Uh, he is a man of extraordinary uh, ability and, and, uh, and intellect, nevertheless, and uh, he says he, he began writing Pilgrim's Progress um, for himself, and, um, and then uh, had the thought that uh, these, these, uh, these parabolic images uh, flowed out of him, and uh, he soon found uh, after the first 12 years in prison that most of the manuscript had been written. Um, it wasn't completed in, in that first imprisonment. There's a, there's a point in the narrative in, in Pilgrim's Progress where he says in poetic form, uh, I awoke from my dream, and then I fell asleep again and dreamt again. And, and that's him telling you, that's John Bunyan telling you, that from this point onwards, this second part was written during his second imprisonment in uh, 1676. Uh, uh, when he is released, uh, the manuscript is done. Nobody wanted to publish it. He was a relative unknown uh, even then, uh, besides which uh, he was on the wrong side of the establishment. And John Owen uh, the great Puritan theologian who had been Oliver Cromwell's, uh, on Oliver Cromwell's side and had been, had been uh, Oliver Cromwell's um, uh, minister. Uh, in the 1670s, John Owen 
uh, is on the other side, uh, he could play a deft political game, John Owen, and he is having conversations with Charles II. Uh, he mentions John Bunyan to Charles II, and Charles II dismisses him as an unlearned uh, babbler. And John Owen said to the king, Charles II, that he would give up all of his learning if he could preach one sermon like John Bunyan. I think it took Charles II by surprise. Uh, and uh, John, Bunyan, uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was published at John Owen's uh, request. Uh, it was John Owen's publishers who published uh, part one of Pilgrim's Progress. It was a, a massive success, so much so that other people began to write part two under pseudonyms pretending to be John Owen because there was money to be made. Uh, and I think John uh, Bunyan, uh, having lived a fairly frugal uh, life, of course, while he was in prison, uh, and now in, in the last sort of decade of his life, uh, lived, and, and if you've seen pictures of uh, John Bunyan in his latter years, and that's probably the picture of John Bunyan that you have, he, he's, he's quite full of figure, uh, and I think uh, John Bunyan loved his food when he left prison. Uh, one of the things you should look for in reading John Bunyan is his description of meals, and he talks about the food in the meals. And this was food, sometimes he talks about, about fruits like uh, pomegranates, which was not uh, your commonal garden uh, fruit uh, eaten in the 17th century, but he's, uh, he is describing, I think, something, something of the goodness of God to him uh, after he left uh, prison. Now, what can you expect when you read uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? Well, uh, first of all, uh, it covers… Uh, John Bunyan is a Puritan, and when I say he's a Puritan, uh, I mean he is someone who believes in uh, the authority, final authority of the Bible. He believes in the importance of doctrine. Bunyan is a Calvinist to the core, as all the Baptists in the 17th century. This is leading up to the Second London Confession that uh, Vardy Bokum was talking about earlier in the Q&A session, uh, or the 1689 Baptist Confession. These are Calvinistic uh, documents as opposed to Arminian. Uh, so, the Baptists of the 17th century, like uh, John Bunyan, uh, were thoroughgoing uh, Calvinists who held to a, a reformed soteriology, a reformed view of how it is that a person is saved. So, so you can expect reading Pilgrim's Progress not just, uh, not just a cracking good story, and, it, and it's a great story. Uh, you can read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress just for the story alone. It's a great story. It's a great narrative. It's a great piece of 17th century English literature. Uh, it is something that all of our children and college students ought to read. So, uh, next time your kids have a birthday or a Christmas or something, buy them uh, an edition of Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, and put on it fantasy literature for Reformed uh, Calvinist theologians. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Bunyan is a Puritan. Uh, what, what kind of things does he emphasize in Pilgrim's Progress? Um, certainly the Bible. Um, it's said of John Bunyan uh, that if you, if you pricked him uh, his blood would be bibline. A Bible text would, would come out of his veins. Um, I think he memorized a good portion of Scripture when he was in prison. You know, you're confined to almost one room in a, in a prison cell. Uh, he was allowed books and literature, and uh, he, he was not one who read widely, but he was one who read deeply and thoroughly. And I think John Bunyan knew his Bible from cover to cover. And uh, uh, whenever, whenever Christian in part one of the story gets himself into trouble and he finds himself in the, 
slough or slew or slough of despond, uh, it's slough, but, but you, may, you may use a different pronunciation here. But whenever, whenever Christian gets himself into trouble in the slough of, uh, slough of despond or in, uh, the, in the dungeon of, uh, of giant despair, uh, or uh, when in part two you have, uh, you have a character who's crippled uh, and he's got uh, crutches, uh, and he's uh, actually at one point he's dancing uh, with his crutches. Uh, all of those, all of those images uh, allude to the importance of Scripture. You remember, of course, uh, in the dungeon of giant despair with uh, faithful that they are despairing, uh, actually despairing so much. And it might take your breath away if you don't remember that part of the story, but despairing so much that Christian is threatening to take his life. Now, that's fairly shocking in the 17th century in what was meant to be something for family reading that he would introduce as his main character, someone who is tempted because of the trials that he finds himself in to suicide. Uh, and that's a very interesting feature. It, it, it's just one line. You can pass it over. I think, I think that's a deeply sensitive pastoral thing that uh, Bunyan is doing at that point. But you remember, of course, what gets them out of Doubting Castle. He remembers a key called promise, uh, and, and that, of course, is an allusion to the Scriptures. Uh, um, he, he talks about… Uh, he talks about uh, the Scriptures as a, a, a sword, and he has a character in part two of uh, Pilgrim's Progress called Mr. Um, Mr. Valiant for Truth, and he has a sword which is described as a right Jerusalem blade. Isn't that a wonderful description? It's a right Jerusalem blade. Uh, and it's an image, of course, of, uh, of Scripture, that uh, Scripture is, uh, is a divider, a sunder of joints and marrow, soul and, and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. So, so Bunyan's, Bunyan's point in Pilgrim's Progress is to get you to understand Scripture, but not just to understand Scripture, but to understand a a particular interpretation of Scripture, a, a reformed Calvinist soteriology uh, in Scripture. Uh, you're not two pages into the narrative. You, you, you meet uh, Christian. Uh, he's fleeing the city of destruction. He's leaving his wife and four children behind. He's carrying a, a book in his hand, and he's got a burden uh, on his back, and he asks, uh, evangelist, and evangelist says, do you see, uh, do you see yon sepulcher? And Christian says, no, I don't see it. And, and so he says, do you see yon wicked gate? I have to say, as a teenager, I read that as wicked with a D uh, rather than wicked with a T. Wicked is narrow, uh, the narrow gate, uh, an allusion, of course, to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, one of the things uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the huge things in reading Pilgrim's Progress is when, uh, when Christian goes through the narrow gate, the wicked gate, he then, uh, he then uh, finds himself in, in various places, and one of the places that he finds himself in is uh, the interpreter's uh, house. Uh, in the house of interpreter, he sees uh, many things, seven things, seven sort of portraits, if you like. One of them was of a very grave uh, person with a, a book in his hand, and uh, it's a picture of a, of a, a, a preacher of the gospel who's uh, committed to uh, the Scriptures and so on. And uh, Bunyan is saying that if you're going to grow as a Christian, uh, then you need a, you need a good preacher. You need a good teacher. You need somebody who loves the Bible and who's prepared to preach the Bible and, and so on. That's one of the lessons that Christian is learning. Another lesson that he learns in the House of Interpreter is uh, the man in the iron cage. He's a man, and he professed to be a Christian, and uh, he has evidently uh, done something, or at least he thinks he has done something, and, uh, and he cannot get out of this 
cage. He is locked into this cage, and he cannot get out. There is no way out of this cage. And uh, Bunyan is uh, emphasizing the importance of perseverance, the perseverance of the saints. He that perseveres to the end shall be saved. It's remarkable. I don't think this would be part of a gospel presentation in 2014, but for, Bun for John Bunyan, it is important that as you set out on this journey, that you set out on a journey that is a biblical journey, and that it is a journey that, that in which you have to persevere right to the very end. But he still has his burden. And you're maybe a quarter of the way into Pilgrim's progress before he comes to the hill called Calvary, and his burden falls off and rolls into the tomb and disappears. And that sets up that sets up a bit of a, a, a conundrum in the story. When was Christian converted? Was he converted when he lost his burden, or was he converted when he entered the wicket gate? And is Bunyan saying that the only way that you can be sure of the genuineness of your Christian profession is that you have experienced the burden of sin in a way and to the same degree as Christian does in part one of Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, that was part of the question, I think, that came up uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think that's a, that's a misunderstanding of what Bunyan was trying to say, but it was a misunderstanding that arose as soon as the book was published. And in part two, you will see Bunyan trying to answer that pastoral problem. How much, how much repentance do we need for it to be genuine repentance? Uh, somebody asked that question today. And, and the way in which that repentance on our part can become, as it were, in a, in a yes, can I use the word legalistic in its correct way? Uh, in the way that it ought to be used. You're, you're, you're saying here, yes, I do need to repent, but it needs to be this kind of repentance to this degree, and, and we trust and rest in the quality of our repentance, and we turn repentance into a work. Uh, and uh, Bunyan in part two, you'll notice him addressing that issue. Part one Bunyan was not saying this is the norm that every Christian experiences, namely a long period uh, in which you wrestle with sin and finally come to uh, an assurance of your salvation. Bunyan is giving you an autobiography. Right? So, part one of Pilgrim's Progress is Bunyan's story. This is how he experienced coming to faith. But he wasn't saying this is the paradigm that every single uh, individual who professes to be a Christian uh, must uh, experience. Uh, reading Pilgrim's Progress will underline uh, the fact that the Christian life uh, is a battle. Uh, it's a battle uh, all the way uh, from beginning to end. It's a battle uh, it's a battle to the death, uh, and, and, and all along you will, meet, uh, you will meet temptation, you will meet the flatterers, you'll meet uh, folk like Madam Wanton and Madam uh, Bubble and uh, Giant Despair and his, uh, and his wife and, and, and so on. And, and uh, who, who can ever forget the description Bunyan gives to the magnificent battle with, uh, with Apollyon. And the description of that battle is probably among, in English literature, it's probably among one of the most eloquent and graphic descriptions of a battle scene in a, in a couple of pages. Uh, I, I, would, I would defy anyone to come up with a two-page uh, summary of a battle more descriptive and more gripping uh, than Bunyan's in uh, Pilgrim's Progress Part uh, 1. He is, of course, simply saying uh, 
uh, that uh, the Christian life, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness uh, of this uh, world. Um, but who can, uh, who can ever forget the description of Vanity Fair? Uh, who can ever forget the description of uh, the jury uh, in Vanity Fair? Uh, who, can ever, uh, who can ever forget the extraordinary scene of uh, Faithful's uh, death in Vanity Fair? and how uh, Elijah-like chariots uh, take him, uh, as it were, into, into the clouds of an incredibly moving scene uh, of the death, uh, of, the death of, um, of uh, faithful. And then uh, at the end of part one, uh, as uh, an, a new character, hopeful and Christian, are crossing the waters. And, uh, I thought I would just read a, a little section from Pilgrim's Progress. Then they addressed themselves to the water, and entering Christian began to sink. And crying out to his good friend, hopeful, he said, I sink in deep waters, the billows go over my head, all his waves go over me. Then said the other, Be of good cheer, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is good. Then said Christian, Ah, my friend, the sorrows of death have compassed me about. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with that a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see as before. And here in a great measure lost his senses, so that he could neither remember nor orderly talk of any of those sweet refreshments that he had met with in the way of his pilgrimage. But all the words that he spoke still tended to discover that he had horror of mind and heart fears, that he should die in that river and never obtain entrance in at the gate." Here also, as they stood by, perceived he was much in the troublesome thoughts of the sins that he had committed, both since and before he began to be a pilgrim. It was also observed that he was troubled with apparitions of hobgoblins and evil spirits. Forever and anon he would intimate so much by words, hopeful therefore here had much ado to keep his brother's head above water. Yea, sometimes he would be quite gone down, and then ere a while he would rise up again half dead. Hopeful also would endeavor to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate and men standing by to receive us. But Christian would answer, Tis you, tis you they wait for, for you have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And so have you, said he to Christian. Ah, brother, said he, surely if I was right, he would now arise to help me. But for my sins he hath brought me into the snare and hath left me. Then said hopeful, my brother, you have quite forgot the text where it is said of the wicked, there is no band in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. These troubles and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God hath forsaken you, but are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which heretofore you have received of His goodness and live upon in your distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was in a muse a while, to whom also Hopeful added these words, Be of good cheer, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. And with that, Christian, break out with a loud voice, Oh, I see him again, and he tells me, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Then they both took courage. And the enemy was after that as still as a stone until they were gone over. Christian therefore presently found ground to stand upon, and so it followed that the rest of the river was but shallow. Thus they got over. Now upon the bank of the river on the other side they saw the two shining men again who there waited for them. Wherefore, being come out of the river, they saluted them, saying, 
We are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those that shall be heirs of salvation. Now, that's just a little, a little snippet of uh, Pilgrim's Progress and how uh, Hopeful and Christian are passing through the river, the river of death, and onto the other side. And then, uh, and then right at the end, oh, like, like any good book or any good movie, in the, in the very closing sentences, Bunyan says, um, you know, Hopeful and Christian, they've made it… Uh, They've made it through uh, into the gates of the celestial city, and then in the side of the hill leading up to the celestial city, on the other side of death, there is a door that, that leads straight to hell. And uh, Bunyan, is, uh, Bunyan is ever the evangelist, uh, and he's ever the uh, exhorter, and my time is gone and I need to stop because the next one is starting in like two minutes, and I'm going to be in huge trouble if I don't end on time. But uh, Pilgrim's Progress, parts one and two, and I think I'm supposed to say something about the video series, uh, the guided tour by some guy named Thomas. But uh, make, sure, uh, make sure that this generation catches the enthusiasm once again of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress as a teaching tool and guide for the Christian life. It is the best pastoral theology that you will ever read.